Turn back in your Bible to the book of Isaiah chapter 7. We're going to start there. We're going to do a survey through the selected portions of scripture that are given to us in Isaiah. I thought I'd take us to the Old Testament for a minute and contemplate the spirit of prophecy. According to John in Revelation 19, 10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Some of us have been blessed by that testimony for decades upon decades upon decades. We pray that that would be the case for you today. I absolutely believe that God has to take us through the time that we're going. He never does anything that doesn't have merit for his people. But we are in a low ebb. The idea of worshiping the newborn king should have had you so excited that you didn't go to sleep last night. And everybody in the house should have been shouting from the top of their lungs, Oh, come, all ye unfaithful. Because if God were to ever call a faithful one, none of us should come. The birth of Christ is not just a traditional holiday to observe and to kind of put your two cents in and give God his props and keep it moving. The birth of Christ is the epitome of God's love to sinners. And it's the foundation upon which rebel sinners can be made like God in the person of his son Jesus. An infinite love beyond our comprehension. And what we have before us today is really beyond our comprehension as well. The title of our message, hopefully you can keep up with me for a minute. I said I'm not going to be long. I don't want to be long, but I really don't have anywhere to go. A virgin shall be with child. That child will be called a prince and a king. The most glorious story in all of the universe. May God give you grace to actually be made aware that you are in the presence of his spirit and in the presence of his son. And may he deliver us from all forms of carnal worship. And we might behold his glory. If the contemplation of the incarnation of almighty God doesn't humble you, nothing will. What a blessed, blessed day. What a blessed opportunity to sit under the preaching of the word of God in celebration of the God man, Jesus Christ. What a blessing. What a blessing that he gave us grace to not be trapped by the commandments of men that we might gather together and worship the newborn king. What a, what a blessing. What a blessing. The selected scriptures we're going to be dealing with address what I call celebrating in the midst of conflict, celebrating in the midst of conflict, the birth of the most controversial figure in the world. We rejoice in the good news that the Savior, the Christ, the Lord is born not on this day, but one day he was born. He wasn't born on December 25th, for sure. We could easily argue that. But the birth of Christ is not to be argued, but celebrated. I love the way Luke puts it. This day is born unto us a child, a son, a king, the Christ, the Messiah, even as the scriptures have stated. What day is that? No one knows that day in history. The patristic fathers didn't get it right. The early church didn't get it right. Neither the Orthodox Greek church nor the Roman Catholic church got it right. They all celebrated on different days, even now around the world. The American church does not know that. It doesn't know that Christ is celebrated on all kind of different days. It does not matter what day. It does not matter what the day is. It only matters that Christ is so valuable in your heart that you celebrate him. It really just does not matter the day. Don't waste five minutes arguing with people about the day. Argue with them about the fact that God sent his only begotten son into the world to save sinners. 
That's the beauty of the event. That's the beauty of, of what's in front of us. Again, it's a celebration in the midst of conflict. It's a, it's a, it's a story of the redemption of God in Christ, personified in, in Christ in the midst of rebellion. There's a composite that you and I want to look at in Isaiah chapter 7 and Isaiah chapter 9 and then Isaiah chapter 11. I want to span that window of text to kind of build you a composite of what the children of Israel waited for and, and longed for. Yea, and according to Isaiah chapter uh, 11, even the Gentiles, we in spirit longed for the coming of the son of the living God. And we want to comprehend one more time the nature of the gospel of God's glory in Christ our Savior in both his humility and in his triumph. I want to see if I can make this narrative come home to you. When you're contemplating the birth of Christ, his early life, his ministry, you're contemplating his humility, his humility. And to capture that attribute is critical. None who are called by the grace of God should abort the opportunity at all times to be humble. None who are objects of God's mercy and grace should abort at any time the quality of humility. Humility is what marks Jesus Christ. Humility is what marks him. And, and, and what you and I are going to learn over the weeks and months to come, I hope, is that trouble is the context and matrix out of which humility is exalted. Humility is exalted in the midst of trouble. Uh, uh, no one is more winsome and appealing to us than a humble person when everybody else is acting a fool. Would you agree? Humility becomes such a vivid manifestation of a behavior pattern on the part of someone who has all power and yet is walking in a level of humility that becomes clear and vivid to everyone that's looking for him. So what we're dealing with when we're talking about the birth of Christ, you guys, we're dealing with a, a conflation of an environment, a surrounding, a t context of trouble, of difficulty, of chaos, of wars, of upheavals in society, of, of, of treason, of apostasy, Sound like our time, right? And I've shared with you over the last year that there are great similarities between the season that you and I are in and the season in which our Savior was born. Great similarities. We'll see that in the opening verses of Isaiah chapter 9. But as we look at Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, that's the verse I want us to consider. And under it, the first thing I want us to consider out of three major things today is his miraculous birth. His miraculous birth. Isaiah 7, 14 is the verse I want up there, if you don't mind. The second thing I want us to consider, it's in your outline, is his extensive reign, the extent to which Christ reigns. This is all given to us in the prophecy of Isaiah. And then finally, what I want to deal with is the dynamic of his ministry. All of them each one of these headings require its own development for sure, but I just want to touch on it a bit today. His miraculous birth. We are told in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 these words, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name what? Emmanuel. And the writer to in the gospel lets us know in Matthew and in Luke that the term Emmanuel literally means God with us. That is not a proper name given to Christ. That is a nomenclature or title ascribing to him a characteristic unique to Jesus. God as near to mankind as he can be without obliterating them. Emmanuel, God with us. It's a beautiful thing. The text describes to us what I call the miraculous birth. On the one hand, what makes it miraculous is that it's a virgin. And the text is explicit about that. We won't go into any of the landmines around unbelief that pour upon this text and argue that the Hebrew term here is not a virgin. It is in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Contextually, it's a virgin. So we know we're dealing with a miracle or a paradox or a tension, right? How can a virgin be with child? That's paradoxical, but it can when God's in it. 
So here's where where you and I want to start when it comes to reading the Bible, particularly around Jesus. What's impossible with man is always possible with God. What makes our salvation possible is that God was the one who did the impossible. And so when we're dealing with the virgin with child, the virgin with child, she shall conceive and bear a son in this context, not a daughter, but a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What I want to call your attention to are two fundamental major points of consideration. And then finally, a third one. It's not minor, but it, it's kind of like correlated to our next point. And that is under point number one, we are not dealing with what is often understood or rather misunderstood as an immaculate conception. We are not dealing with an immaculate conception, but we are dealing with a remarkable protection. We are not dealing with an immaculate conception. We are dealing with a remarkable protection that results in his star so shining in the midst of the darkness of humanity that men and women can easily say Jesus is the light of the world. Now, let me go back to my first fundamental negation of a sub point. We're not dealing with the immaculate conception. You've heard that term before, have you not? How many here have not heard the term? Don't raise your hand unless you have never heard the term immaculate conception because it's everywhere prominent in cultures where people have not really had the opportunity to think through the influence of traditional doctrines that come up out of either the Orthodox Church or out of Catholicism. And when I say the immaculate conception is not what's in view here, let me help you with it and this will be a blessing to you. The idea of the Immaculate Conception is not to be misconstrued as somehow referring to uh, Mary having Jesus in some kind of immaculate, impeccable way of, of his being brought into the world, like somehow um, immaculate really means sinless, it means pure, it means without blemish. So the idea of the conception of Jesus in Mary is not about Jesus in that doctrinal sense. It's about Mary. And here's the point. The idea of the immaculate conception is the idea, not so much that Jesus was sinless. We know that. But the assertion is that Mary was sinless. And that becomes the problem when you think it through. First of all, if you're a pure biblicist, and you don't allow the parameters of information to jade your interpretation of scripture, then you cannot find in scripture any kind of justifiable grounds for anyone in the world being sinless but Jesus. So we're going to start from the fundamental premise that none are righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. There's none that seeketh God. There's none that understands. There's none righteous. No, not even beloved Mary. But the assertion is that she was somehow made to be sinless in order that Jesus might have a human nature that is sinless. Do you guys understand that? That is the fundamental argument for those of you who may have to face that at some time. So let's work through the fallacy of that assertion. We can Again, we can argue from the standpoint of silence. Scripture does not give us any grounds to believe that anyone other than the Lord Jesus is sinless. Okay? But, and if one were to contemplate and entertain the sinlessness of Mary, how did that happen? After so many thousands of years of human beings being sinners from the days of our first mother, Eve and Adam. So the argument goes that in some kind of arbitrary way, because Mary is this super blessed woman, that God somehow protected her from sin when she was in the womb of her parents, traditionally Joachim and Anne. Some of you may know that historically. This is in the Apocrypha writings. Of course, Mary had parents. We better believe that. Although the problem that is about to emerge is one that becomes obvious and has been obvious for most uh, theologians who understand the need to be jealous about the uniqueness of Jesus. Because what happened with Mary, and this year was the struggle that happened in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th century, and it made its way on up until the last couple of 200 years, is what is called the ascendancy of the Ma Marian doctrine. Mary becomes holier and holier, more righteous, more sinless, 
Now she is being elevated to the level of co-redemptrix. Now Mary is a mediator right along with the Lord Jesus. And early patristic fathers picked up on the what we call the little leaven that leavens the whole lump. We recognize the moment that you pull on the garment of the exclusivity of Christ, you unravel the whole thing. The moment you make Mary sinless, you got to make her now somehow unique in her life. You got to make her unique in her death. You got to make her unique in her resurrection. You got to make her unique in her position with God. Now she bears equality with the son. Now she bears equality with God. Now she's the one to whom people can come to ask for forgiveness from Jesus. And that is the whole doctrine of what we call rank heresy, abominable heresy, for which our Catholic friends are under obligation by Pope Pius IX to embrace as essential Christian doctrine. So please hear me. Your dear, beloved Catholic loved ones cannot fundamentally say that they have the same gospel as you do if they understand their own doctrine. And you cannot be ignorant enough to say we worship the same Jesus if you don't understand the error of their doctrine. So now let's just work this through just a little bit. The problem with the assertion that Mary has to be sinless in order that Jesus has a womb of sinlessness to actually have a sinless human nature creates what we call the regression of Zerdium. What do you mean by that, Pastor? If Mary has to be sinless in order that Jesus has a sinless body, then Mary's mom and daddy has to be sinless in order for Mary to have a sinless body. But now if Mary's mom and daddy is sinless in order that Mary might have a sinless body, in order that Jesus might have a sinless body, then Mary's mom and daddy's mom and daddy have to have a sinless body in order that they might, you see the regression of Zerdium? This is logic. So please understand when you're talking with your Catholic friends, basically what they are denying is the doctrine of original sin. In Adam all die. For by one man sin entered into the world, Romans 5, 12, and death passed upon all, for all have what? What we say and what I often do with as much grace as I can when I'm burying people, I say, you see this body right here? It's going into the ground, not because of nature, but because of sin. I'll give it a few moments for people to recover from explicit Bible doctrine. And uh, uh, tell Louis to set the AC on 70 cool. Um, when they recover, I say we should not be here were it not for the rebellion of our first parents. God did not create us to die. That is not a characteristic of the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei at its center is living. The one true and living God lives forever. He cannot die. He cannot mutate. He cannot diminish. He cannot advance. He cannot grow. He is impeccable and perfect altogether in his essence and ontology. And when he created Adam and Eve in his image and in his glory, he meant for them to live forever. So death is a real stain on the Imago Dei. Would you agree? But it's a stain because of sin. So when we bury our loved ones, we are affirming that we are all by nature what? Well, now, if Sister Mary wasn't a sinner, how do we put her in the ground? That's why they hurried up and got her out of the ground and assumed her up into heaven by a special mystical ascension that none of us know anything about. It's called the Assumption of Mary. Do you guys understand that doctrine? So I'm trying to help you understand how in a very diabolical and dangerous way, it is absolutely important for those of you who are jealous for the holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, great high priest Jesus Christ, who alone is God's mediator between God and man. You have to be jealous for his exclusive sinlessness because otherwise he becomes just like the rest of any one of us who could arbitrarily attain to the status that him and his mama did. You guys got that? It's extremely important to know then that you don't play with the term immaculate conception. Understand it before you employ it, all right? Because right now in the Catholic Church, so sad 
but it is expected when you start unraveling sound doctrine in exchange for the traditions of men. Catholicism, very much like the Jewish culture, collapsed in all kinds of paganism hundreds and thousands of years ago. Very much like you and I are reading in the book of the Revelation right now, the great whore of Revelation 17. The Catholic Church also bears that same characteristic of being a great whore, opening the door up open to all kinds of pagan religions. Right now, there is a major thrust in the Vatican to do what many of the Catholic churches have compromised throughout different countries where there has been what is called female deity worship. It's been going on for centuries upon centuries. Female deity worship. Today, it's Puchamama. Anybody know about Puchamama? Yeah, well, do your work because it's a big old idol, female, pregnant, female kind of asterisk God that the Pope has brought right into the middle of the Catholic Church and is busting up Catholicism as we speak, as it ought, because the whole world is under a present blinding apostasy right now. And a movement from a Christocentric exclusivity of the one true and living God to the worshiping of, of female deities is becoming prevalent everywhere in the world. And it was all sparked by an elevation of our beloved sister Mary. Do you guys understand what I just said? So when we think about the miraculous birth of our Savior, we are diametrically opposed to any notion of an immaculate conception as per Catholicism. But we very much affirm, very much affirm a remarkable protection. Let me show you something briefly on it. Luke's gospel, chapter 1, verse 35, if I've got the text right, Luke's gospel, chapter 1, verse 35, lays out an expression to us around the conception of the God-man in the womb of his mother Mary that I just want to briefly talk to you about and, and articulate exegetically. When we read the angel explaining to Mary in verse 35, he said, and I'll start at verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be seeing I know not a what? Which means she's a what? There you go. This is how we establish sound doctrine. I've never known a man. I'm a spouse to Joseph. I'm legally married to Joseph, but we have not consummated the marriage yet. I don't know anything about conjugal intimacy. How on earth am I going to be with child? Now notice what the language says. And the angel answered unto her and said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. Who is the Holy Spirit? The third person of the blessed Godhead. The third person who is the dynamic of God, he is the one who actually moves as the agent by which God's will gets done. He's the one that created the heavens and the earth. The spirit of God garnished the heavens by the decree of the son, by the will of the father did they work to create. We call him the efficiency of God. You guys understand that? Not by power, not by might, but by my what? Spirit, saith the Lord. In the same way, the Spirit of God brooded over the waters in the Genesis narrative in a mystical way of him brooding over the waters to take the chaos and create order and create division and distinction in order that his creative dynamic would appear after the declaration, let there be what? Light. The mystery of the work of the third person takes place here overcoming Mary. This term here, come upon her, literally is the term to means to surround her and to seize her, to bring her captive. The Spirit of God on a particular day appointed surrounded Mary, overcame Mary, and seized her. That's the literal terminology there. It's the same idea that Jesus taught when he says, if a man is going to take a strong man's house, he must first what? Overcome him subdue him and then he can take his house it's the idea of being able to completely seize completely capture and the spirit of god completely took mary over he completely encompassed her he completely got a hold of her she became the subject of a mysterious work that's now to be articulated in the second line and the holy ghost shall come upon you and the power of the highest that is the father Working through the spirit, the power, the spirit of the highest, the father shall now what? Overshadow thee. Now, I love this term 
Now, Luke is a doctor, but the Holy Ghost is the greatest doctor, so we don't even have to have Luke in the equation, but we do. And the term that Luke uses here is the same term that's used in Luke chapter 9 when John, James, and Peter are on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, guess what happens? They are overshadowed by the cloud that symbolizes the presence of God. All through the Old Testament, the cloud comes, right? Whenever the cloud comes, it's a symbol of God's presence, but it's also a symbol of the mystery of God. It's a symbol of the inexplicability of God. In other words, when the cloud comes, we are blessed to know God's there, but we don't know nothing about what he's doing. So you hold intention, mystery, while holding certainty, intention at the same time. I'm certain God is present. I have no idea what he's up to. I'm certain that he's present because the cloud is following us by day and the pillar of fire by night, right? I'm certain God is present because he has told us my cloud, which is a symbol of my presence will be among you. But the cloud underscores the fact that God's ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts that we could never, ever penetrate into the scrutability of God. His ability to know and to do and to perform must remain with you and me a miracle that we have no idea about. Don't even begin to contemplate how God could enter into the physicality of a human being and produce a life form that you and I can explain scientifically. It cannot be done and it should not be done. It should not be done any more than you try to explain how you've been born again. Let me explain to you how I've been born again. One day, you can't do it. The wind blows hither and yon, and you don't know from whence it comes or whence it goes. Even so are they that are born of the Spirit. You have no capacity to control the wind. You can't determine the wind. You can't direct the wind. You can't grasp it in your hand. You can't put it in a bottle. You can't sell it. So when people tell you the Holy Ghost is over here, you know he's not. Did you hear what I just stated? The Holy Ghost over here. You mean he ain't over here also? I thought he was God. So the point being, ladies and gentlemen, is make sure that when God privileges you and me to bump up against mystery, biblical testimony of mystery, embrace it in the humility. See, this is what I was talking about earlier. Humility. Embrace it in the humility of what's impossible with man is what? Possible with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You and I could never, ever embrace the God-man Jesus Christ apart from the gift of faith, could we? If we had to explain scientifically how the hypostases took place, we couldn't do it. If we had to explain scientifically how we were born again, we could not do it. We could not explain the presence of God in the Shekinah glory, overshadowing James, Peter, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration in the same way he overshadowed Mary. What a glorious reality. The power of the Most High God took a common sinner. I could hear Mary hearing the song, Come, all ye unfaithful, come, and the Lord will manifest his glory in you. And that sister came, didn't she? She came. And the Spirit of God took our blessed sister and used her as a place by which the Son of God would tabernacle and rest among us. This is what we mean by a remarkable protection. That's the language here. And when we talk about a remarkable protection, that remarkable protection not only occurred in the womb of Mary to conceive the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary, but that remarkable protection covered the whole of Christ's life. Remember, we have repeatedly called our, our attention to Revelation chapter 12, verse Four and five. Pull up Revelation 12, 4. And I share it with you. Here we have in the apocalypse the pregnant woman who is holding the deposit of our salvation in the person of Jesus, right? This is Mary, obviously in the personified state, right? It's the church as a whole, but it's Mary personally. No other woman fits the criterion, right? So watch. His tail through, through, drew the third part of the stars of heaven. It cast him to the earth, and the dragon stood before the what? 
Who was this woman? Mary. You guys understand that? He stood before Mary, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child. Who is the child? As soon as he be born, and you and I know the narrative, this is why we say we celebrate amongst a conflict. Celebration among conflict. The celebration of the birth of Christ is among the conflict of the demonic powers that are poised as soon as he is born to kill him. You guys know that. That's Herod, the false Judite king, the imposter. The, 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 the reprobate, the knockoff, the one who was so jealous and so envious and so uh, uh, be riddled with fear that he had every child two years old and younger slain in order that it might come to pass. Rachel lamenting for her children, as you guys know, this crazy, insecure, wicked man is afraid of this child. It gives me a little bit of an understanding of how much Herod knew about the scriptures and how demonically controlled he was. Because the picture you're looking at is the whole kingdom of the devil poised to take out the Messiah. This is paradigmatic dynamic of where you and I are today. The mystery of what's about to take place next underscores what I mean by this uh, divine protection, this miraculous protection, this providence of God to protect Christ in the womb to protect him out of the womb. You and I already know that Joseph was submissive to the angel again and again, was he not? The angel said, go down to Egypt, hang out for a minute, come back when Herod is dead. He comes back and he's about to go back home. Then he realizes Herod's little cousin is running the throne. The angels are right, going up to Nazareth. Hang out in Nazareth until he's dead, then you can come down. God is watching over the child all his life, is he not? But the book of the Revelation does not give you and I the historicity of the child's life. All we have in the book of the Revelation is his birth, watch this, and his ascension into glory. Look at what it says here in verse 5. Revelation 12, 5. This is a point that I want to bring home now. And as soon as he was born, as soon as she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, we'll be going there in a minute, her child was caught up unto God. In the apocalypse, from Matthew 2 to Matthew chapter 28, are you ready? All the rest of those chapters are gone. He's born in Matthew 2, he's raised again in Matthew 27, 28, and he ascends into heaven. Chapters 3 to chapters 27 are completely gone, are they not? Why is that? Because of the certainty of a sovereign God who infallibly purposed a life for Christ that could not be impeded, though all hell came against him. In the book of the Revelation, it was so certain that Jesus would accomplish eternal redemption for us. It was so certain that he would never, ever one time sin. It was so certain that he would set his face like a flint and not be moved. Christ wouldn't budge. He would not be tempted to sin. He would not be overcome with sin. It was so certain the obedience of that child that the vision you and I have in Revelation chapter 12 is he was born and then he was called up to God and to his throne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's worthy of is worthy of enjoying because part of the problem in my generation is that we're so man centered. We can't rejoice in the bigness of God. How big is God? He's so big that he can save sinners before even sending his son into the world. He's so big, he can save men and women on credit in our eyes, but with the Godhead, it's not credit because he sees the end from the beginning. Why? Because it's all infallibly decreed by God. Not one of his precepts could fail. Insofar as we're concerned, the moment that God thought it, it was done. Am I making some sense? So when Jesus comes into the world and goes through all of the crazy stuff that he's going through, when we read it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it's worthy to read, the consolation that you're to get out of that is that if you're in Christ, just as certain as it was for Christ to come out of the womb and be immediately caught up to God, so it is for me and so it is for you if you're in Jesus. I'm already at the right hand of God in Christ. 
I'm already seated with him. I'm already redeemed. I'm already forgiven. I'm already righteous. I'm already justified. I'm already glorified. I'm already rejoicing with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Are you already rejoicing? This is what the babe does for me. This is what the babe does for me. The babe makes me happy. Now, let me just give you one caveat so we can move to our next point around the babe. Why is it that a baby is caught up to heaven and seated at the right hand of God to be his son and vicar over the world? Why is it that it's a baby? Can I, can I give you just a, what I consider a sanctified opinion? I can argue it scripturally, but maybe not fully flesh it out. Can I give you one reason why? Because when you're a baby, that's the best you're going to be. The moment you get two or three, it's all naughty and not nice. You go from one rebellion to the next rebellion. It's better that God saves you as a baby, take you on to glory. Except you become like a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And let me expand on that. The little baby there is an indicative that corresponds to his mother Mary in the book of the Revelation that you don't see with the whore. And here's what it is. The whore arrogates to herself deity, doesn't she? I am. And I will be no widow and I will not be childless and I'll do whatever I want. Is that the way she talks? Well, listen, children of God, that's how grown people talk. We are insane. We are rebels. And the older we get, the more endemic that rebellion is. The grace to be a child is the grace to be humble. It's the grace to be dependent. It's the grace to be compliant. It's the grace to be submissive. And Christ being depicted as a child is him being depicted as the perfect servant. Y'all got that? The perfect servant. This is the way Peter uses it in Acts chapter four. Lord, you see they're raging. Now we ask you in the name of your holy servant, Jesus, that you would show signs and wonders and manifest your glory in Israel. That's Acts chapter four. And in the King James is the word holy uh, child, but literally a servant. The term servant and child in the Greek is just a slight modification in the term paideia. Do you hear what I just stated? In order to be a perfect servant, you have to be a what? Child. Y'all got that? Raise your hand if you got that, because I can keep it moving. And that's the mystery of Christ. He was a perfect son. He was a perfect child, totally dependent upon his daddy. This is why he said to you and me in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, my father always hears me because I always do those things he commands of me. Now, that is the disposition of a child. You guys got that? Not your children and not my children. <laughs> God's child. But you can see then the picture of the, 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 the servant of God operating in the humility of complete dependence upon God. Can you see it? Now, we're going to be coming back a little later on down the line in our study in the book of Revelation as we move into the year 2021. And I'm going to talk about the importance of you and I capturing the motif of the woman and her being carried into the wilderness where she also is protected uh, from the wicked one and how we are nurtured in that wilderness. We're going to develop that because that carries the same connotation. She has been given two wings of a great eagle to fly into her place where she's protected by God. And the indication there is the only way to be protected by God from the crazy of this world is by submission to God, by dependence upon God, by God keeping you and I in such a way that there's a hiding place that God has for you to cover you from all of the crazy of this world because you and I can't handle it by ourselves. I need a hiding place where God is by which he can take care of me from all of the stuff going on in the world that would crush me without the mercy of God in my life. I need a refuge from the storms of this life. I need a place where I can be nurtured in my soul in a way that I can be strengthened in times of trouble from the molestations and the attacks of the world against my soul. But if I'm going to find that place, I'm going to have to be humble like the babe. I'm going to have to be humble like the woman. I'm going to have to submit like the woman she was. Mary said to the Lord Jesus, 
So be it, Lord, according to your word. And when we're operating out of that principle, God shows up in a mighty way, does he not? It's almost always when we're breaking out in the, the uh, if you will, uh, compunction of our own carnal nature that we get in trouble. Even in this time. I want to call your attention now to the last sub point, which is really important. His star in the darkness. So we're looking at the miraculous birth of Christ in the context in which he lived. And again, if you know the surroundings well, it's bad. Politics is bad. Religion is bad. Upheavals everywhere. Christ is born in the midst of this. He is the only thing that makes sense in total nonsense. And here's the way Isaiah chapter 9 puts it in Isaiah 9, 1. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Watch the language as we move into our next set of passages that I want to develop. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as it was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon, the land of Naphtali, and afterwards did grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. What is Isaiah doing? He's introducing us to the context in which the Savior is born. Where is that? Galilee of the nations. We're two chapters after the promise of the virgin child, are we not? We're only two chapters in. Chapter 9 now is going to give us the context into which Jesus grew up. Now, he was born in Bethlehem. But where did he grow up? Nazareth of Galilee. What is the context? Darkness. Look at verse 2. The people that what? Walked in darkness have seen a great light. Is that the way Matthew, Matthew described it in Matthew 2? Of course, the people that walk in darkness, who is that? That's you and me. That's our world right now. That's the wickedness of our culture. That's the crazy thinking, the crazy politics, the crazy ideology. Anything that does not correspond with God's word is darkness. The world is in darkness. It was in darkness in Jesus' day. But notice what it says. The people that have walked in darkness have seen a what? Great light. Who is that great light? It's the child that was born, that was seen in the manger by the Magi, who did what? Followed his star. Is that what the Bible says? Followed his star. A star that was willing to lead the pagans, even in the midst of a dark culture. They came from the east, the text tells us in Matthew 2. And they were so happy. They were so happy when they found in Matthew 2, verse 10 and 11. Start at verse 9, if you will. They were so happy as they made their way all the way down from Iran, or what we would call Persia, Medo-Persia, hundreds of miles from the north, following the star, navigating the skies. They were probably astronomers and astrologers and, and everything else, but God led them because they believed on Messiah. He led them directly to their house. When they had heard, <clears throat> when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east. Now again, the east from Israel would have been in the area of Babylon and Persia. Okay, they saw it in the east. It led them there. This was this would have been a miracle that God would have performed for them. This would not have been your common stars in the constellation. Are you hearing me? This would have been a star that God especially illuminated by which they could have followed the trajectory in terms of their ability to see how stars angle and how they direct. This one would have led them all the way to Judah, all the way to Bethlehem. And then when they got the information from Herod as to the house that Mary and Martha would have been residing in, the star said, here we go right here. Look, it parked over the top of Jesus' house and cut on and went, uh, uh, uh. that's me, that's me, that's me, uh, uh. and they saw it and they said, hallelujah, now look at it. And it went before them till it came and stood over where the child was. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great what? Right. And there again is an extraction worthy of your and my consideration. How much joy enters your heart when you see the star? How much joy fills your heart when you contemplate the glory of God in the person of Christ? Is Jesus the light of the world for you? Is he your clarity? Is he your direction? Is Jesus your course? Is Jesus your way? Is he your illumination? Is he your epiphany? Is he the reason why you understand? Because according to the Bible, Christ is the light. 
And I can imagine if you and I knew anything about abysmal darkness. And then all of a sudden, God cuts the lights off. And we see clearly now what's going on, how relieved our hearts would be and how full our hearts would be that God would have visited you and me with the kind of light. And the text tells us they saw a great light, not just a light, a great light. What you and I are contemplating whenever we contemplate the birth of Christ, listen to me, child of God, is miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle. The miracles are innumerous when you're contemplating the birth of Christ. Why? Because heaven is moving everything to bring to pass the counsel of God. And you're seeing it happen. Heaven is working. Earth is working. Kings are working. Men are working. People are working. I wish I had time. I worship God like nothing this morning as I was contemplating the conversation that Elizabeth and Mary had when Sister Mary decided to go spend some time with her cousin up there yonder in the hills. Mary pregnant and, and uh, Elizabeth pregnant. Now, generally, when you got two women pregnant like that, the best thing to be, brothers, is nowhere around. Just don't be nowhere around. Unless, I'm telling you the truth, unless, and I might preach this next year, but I'm going to just get some to you for free. They both were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, now I'm telling you, I sat there for a long time and said, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. How different the conversation is in the spiritual than in the natural. Because we have so destroyed the glory of God by our preferring to be carnal in times when we struggle than to ask God to anoint us with his spirit. But the kind of fellowship those two women had and the rich dialogue the profoundly Christocentric utterances that came out of Elizabeth's mouth. And she passed that baton to Mary. And I'm going to tell you, when Mary picked that baton up and started preaching, I'm telling you, I, I drank four cups of coffee. It was so good. Because she talked about her Savior. She humbled herself. It wasn't about her. The text doesn't say, blessed above women are you, Mary. Blessed among women are you, Mary. And the moment she took the baton and the Holy Ghost opened her mouth, she says, he did this and he did that and he did this and he did that. God did this and God did that. God has brought down the mighty. God has lifted up the low. God has exalted. God has come. God has visited. God has kept his promises. Now that's how you talk when you're full of the Holy Ghost. God! Not men, not things, God! What a blessing. What a blessing. And now we come to what I call the extensive reign of Jesus Christ given to us in Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah chapter 9, 6. I just want to touch on this a little bit, just a hair to help us understand something of what happens when Christ ascends into heaven, and he did. He's ascended into heaven now, Revelation chapter 12, 4 and 5, and he's on his throne. And he's going to rule the world with a rod of iron. Not going to, has, is, and will. Christ is on his throne. And here's what we're told in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Do you see it? This is the affirmation of his humanity. We could spend all day talking about the implications of the fact that Jesus assumed a human nature, but we've already done part of that. For unto us a what is born? A child is born. Contextually, the first promise here is given to national Israel. This child was for them. Messiah was meant to come to the people of the Jews first. I love it the way Paul put it, Peter put it in Acts 3.26. Unto you first. God sent his son, Jesus, to bless you. Now, haven't we been talking about blessing saints? Those of you who have been following with me, with me, blessing means for God to pour upon you in the area of your limitations and your weaknesses, his strength, his resources, his grace to fill you up and cause you to manifest a kind of fullness that other people see. What the text tells us in Acts 3.26 is that God sent Jesus to national Israel to bless them. Watch this now. In turning away each one of them from their sins. Now, how blessed are you when God sends his son into your heart 
to turn you away from your sins. Do you see that? To turn you away from, to grace you to turn away from your sins as your God, to see God as your God. To grace you to turn away from your sins as an idol to which you cleave to, to see Jesus as your idol. To grace you to turn away from your sins as your slave master, to see Jesus as your Lord. What a grace for God to turn you from your sin. And that's what God came to national Israel to do. And the text tells us unto us a what is given? A son is given. Now we have deity, children of God, because the term son here is not merely emphasizing the gender, although that is critical in the context of a patriarchal paradigm of king servant, which we're about to unpack. Unto us a child is given, that's his humanity. Unto us a, son, a child is born, unto us a son is given, that is his deity. You guys got that? Deity. The sonship of Christ, the huios of God, the sonship of God is the idea that God is going to give himself to the world for their redemption. The king always has a successor. And that successor is ideally to be his what? His son. How loving is the king that in giving his son for our sins, he has given us everything that he has. The father gives his son because the father loves us that much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Are y'all hearing what I'm getting at? Sonship becomes an act of the father in the son to you and me by which we are to love the father. Which one of y'all going to give y'all sons? See what I'm getting at? So this issue of the grace of God and the redemption of sinners is really at its height an act of love. And love is always giving. For God to give his son to you and me is for God to give us everything. He gave us his son who assumed a nature. And the text says, and the government shall be upon his what? Shoulder. All right, don't get into the emphasis of right shoulder, left shoulder. People get all crazy with that. I'm just telling you. It was a symbol in earlier cultures, just like the symbol of the key given to the governor of the city. The shoulder means he bears the responsibility of the goodwill and dignity of the society of which now he has authority over. You guys understand that? And the government of God has been placed upon Christ since the time that Christ rose again from the dead. You do know that, right? God's whole government has been placed upon Jesus. Jesus explicitly stated it in Matthew 28, verse 18. All power and authority has been given unto me of my father. He literally possesses all authority having risen from the dead. And the way the book of Acts presents Christ, Paul put it, Peter put it like this in Acts 2.36, God hath made him both Lord and Christ. That's the way they preached Jesus in the book of Acts. Watch this. Not that he will be Lord, but that he is Lord. Not that he will be a king, but that he is king. Not that he will rule, but that he is ruling. Jesus is on his throne with his father and he's ruling all things right now by the word of his power. Do you believe that? All right. People are going to struggle with that notion, but don't struggle with it. You wouldn't be saved if God wasn't on his throne because God chose you long ago and everything in history had to work out just like it did to get to you one day. That means Jesus was governing the hearts of the kings. He was controlling wicked men, wicked nations, plots and schemes to destroy his people. For the last 2,000 years, Christ made it clear the gates of hell will not prevail. He's been busting them in, going in and drawing out his elect from every nation, kindred, tribe and tongue. I remember the day when the angel kicked the door in, bust through the gates of hell in my own heart. And began to reveal King Jesus to my soul. I remember the day. I remember the day when I fell on my knees and said, Lord, what would you have me to do? I heard about your power. Somebody told me the story. But one day he showed up himself by his spirit 
in the illuminating work of the gospel and broke my heart, broke the chains, brought me to my knees. And just like Paul, Lord, what would you have me to do? Now, that's called conversion. And he's been doing that around the world, everywhere. He has selected men and women to bring them up out, as Mary said, the dunghill and set them on high with princes. This is how we know he's in control. How we know he's in control is he's building his church. Am I making sense? Now, just look at some of the attributions here. I'm just going to talk about them briefly. They all are worthy of uh, development. But my intention for you with these uh, appellations, with these attributions, is simply for you to admire them and then to employ them in your own time. To be admired. What is that? The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Do you see that? Right. So immediately discard the notion of the what we would call uh, proper terminology or proper names. His name is not called Wonderful like his name is called Jesus. His name is called Wonderful like his name is called Emmanuel. His name is called Wonderful like he is called Christos or Messiah or Lord or Curios. His name, his reputation, his standing, his authority. Are you hearing me? When he is called Wonderful, it means that some people have found him to be that. <laughs> All right, right there. Time to preach. Right there. Do you know Jesus? Yes. What about him? He's wonderful. Do you know Christ? Yes. What about him? He's magnificent. Do you know Jesus? What about him? There's none like him. There's none can do what he did. Have you seen what he's done? Have you heard what he said? There's nobody like Jesus. Let me tell you the story. And see, this is what happened all throughout the ministry of Christ the moment he began preaching. He began to exercise his wonderfulness. Everywhere he went, they wondered at Jesus. Did they not? Do y'all know Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John? They all marveled at Jesus. So much so that most of them said, can there anybody else do what Jesus did? This has to be the Christ. He's doing things that are wonderful. That's the name given to the angel that is Christ in the days of Samson's mama and daddy when he came down and acted marvelously in their presence. That's the name given to the angel that showed up with Gideon when Gideon was hiding out of fear and the angel told him, you are a mighty man of God. That's the name of God, God's name, his reputation, his attributes. When they show up in your life in a powerful way are wonderful. When you meet God, his wonder changes your life. Is that true? Now stay with me for a moment. Now you need him to show up a lot more times just because of what you go through. And I'm going to say it again. I just want you to get this because after a while we forget. We forget to wonder. And people look at you and say, it doesn't look like you met Jesus at all the way you acted. I'm going to start right here. I'm going to get at you for a minute. Okay? You need Jesus to show up and do more wonders in your life. You need the master to reveal the power, the subtlety, and the blatantness of his providence in your life. You need God to open your ears and open your eyes so you can see him working. Because what good is it if he's working and you can't see it? If he's speaking and you can't hear it. If he's acting and you can't feel it. Lord, give me feeling for you. Give me hearing for you. Give me seeing. I want to catch you in the subtlety. I want to see your glory in my gumbo this evening when I scoop down and take another sip. I want to bless the Lord, oh my soul, and everything that is within me. How good God is. He made the crab. He made the bluegill. He made the bass. He made the sausage. And then he gave us all of the different cayenne peppers and, and all that stuff is medicinal. All that stuff fights against COVID. You want to build your immune system? Have you some quality gumbo tonight. It'll build your immune system. You think I'm joking? You think I'm joking? And look how, how good God is to us. He builds our immune system up in things that are good to us. 
not only good for us, they're good to us. You're supposed to be worshiping when you eat. You're supposed to be worshiping when you sing. You're supposed to be worshiping God. You should see his glory in everything he's done for you in your life. That's why he gave you eyes, child of God. That's why he gave you eyes. So many of us are blind to the presence of his glory. Lord, make it so that you, I, got, I got an assignment for us. I'm going to share it with you before we close for 21. Because he laid it on my heart. I'm going to just tell it to you. I don't care if it's just one person walk with me in it. And it came out of what we're dealing with. So let me go on to the next couple of attributions. So first of all, wonderful. These are five attributions. They're worthy of their own study. If Jesus ever shows up in your life, he's wonderful. But not only is he wonderful, the text tells us he's a counselor. You see that? So because we do have a uh, 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 colon there, what we don't want to... Uh, 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 Assert is what many have. He's called wonderful counselor. He is a wonderful counselor, but he's wonderful and he's a counselor. Y'all got that? Now, the concept of the counselor should humble all of us. So here's all I'm going to do with that, because you can read everywhere in your Bible about God's precepts, his laws, his decrees are his counselors. And as the psalmist said in Psalm 119, your precepts are my delight. Your, your, your statutes are my counselors. They walk me through my struggle every day. What does that mean, PJ? It means that you and I should be benefiting more profoundly, efficiently, and practically from God's word. We should find God's word able to build us up and give us an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. We should be able to hear from God's word unique and specific guidance for the areas in our life where we're tore up. We should be able to hear in God's word the promises of God unique in particular to every area of our lives where we need help. I want to be able to hear the great counselor tell me how it really is. How it really is. Because we're hearing narratives everywhere. If God speaks to me, then I'll know. Because God is to be trusted. I love it the way the uh, writer to the Colossians puts it in Colossians 2, 3. In Jesus are hid all the treasures. All the treasures. Stop right there for a moment. Paul considered that which is in Christ treasures it's the idea now of coming upon something that is so spectacular so wonderful so valuable that you're just awestruck at not only the glory of it but the multitudinous of it in christ are here all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge did you guys hear that all right all right, so now watch this now. If you got a book that tells you about a savior in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, what's your problem? <laughs> Attribute number three, the mighty God. He's not only wonderful, he's not only our counselor, which means he has a predisposition to straighten us out if we just ask. You don't have to pay. See, I'm still, I'm still messing with you, I shouldn't. <laughs> this is the thing that bothers me though. Christians act like they don't have a Bible. And they act like God's truth is not sufficient to bring them up out of quagmires. That God doesn't speak clearly, that he doesn't speak poignantly, that he doesn't speak effectually. And he does. Do you follow me now. He's wonderful. He's a counselor. He can lead you to freedom. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father. but by And I got a feeling, I just got a feeling that we're putting him aside for Dr. Phil and Dr. Phil good. This is why, now, now, now you remember the woman with the issue of blood? How jacked up she continued to be? It almost ruined her life. And then she finally says, you know what? I'm gonna read Colossians chapter three. And it changed her life. 
put on as the elect of God, bowels of mercy and kindness and gentleness and meekness. And if anyone have a quarrel against any, forgive. Ah, I'd rather pay $300 for somebody to tell me something much more complicated than that. He shall be called the mighty God. I love this. He shall be called the mighty God. Don't you get it wrong. This here is not an opportunity for the son to contend with the father. The father is almighty God, but the son bears equality with the father. And in his equality, he is also almighty. What I say to ignorant folks that love to diminish the quality of Christ's deity, and, and you can have this for free. You don't even have to tell them I told you. When a person asks you, well, is Jesus fully God? Ask them the question, can he not be fully God? Does that make a little sense? Like, what is he, partially God? How much is partially God? Is it nine-tenths, eight-tenths, seven-tenths? See how stupid the proposition is? Either he's all God or he's not God at all. Either he has all power and all authority, either he bears all the attributes and qualities of the Father and the Spirit, or he's not God at all. Am I making some sense? Right. And this is where he says, I and the father are one. You've seen me. You've seen the father. If there's any attribute in Christ that's diminished, he cannot be the truth. Am I making some sense? And so when it talks about the mighty God, it's actually talking about the power of Christ in his office as governor to actually overcome every trouble in your life. There we go again. Here we go again. If your Savior is wonderful in the manifestation of his glories, if your Savior is the counsel that if you go to it, it will deliver you, it will guide you, it will instruct you. And if he's the mighty God, is there anything too hard for him? Cannot he break through any of your opposition, all of your hurdles, all of your troubles, all of your pains? Can he not subdue them? What's the answer? All right. All right. See what I'm getting at? See what I'm getting at? So now for somebody, these things are true. For somebody, these things are true. He's called the mighty God and he's called now the everlasting what? Oh, let's fix that. Can we fix that right quick? Like we have to fix everything else? He's not God the Father. He's God the Son. He never was God the Father. He never will be God the Father. If he were God the Father, he could not be God the Son. I've got two sons and I've got two son-in-laws and they're all my son-in-laws and they will never be me. Do you understand what I just stated? I will always be Papa for all eternity. They will never be me. Now they're equal to me ontologically. They're equal to me in their nature. They're equal to me in their essence. They will never be big Papa. Do you understand that? This is big Papa. Now in their own sphere, they also are big Papa. Because they got children. Not Nate and David. Don't, 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 don't get that wrong. My two son-in-law. So when the phrase is given, the everlasting father, it's talking about the impact of Christ's role in people's lives. That he is as a father figure to us and that he is the immediacy of God in our lives. Let me help you. Isaiah chapter 22, starting at verse 21. I want you to capture it. Two things I want you to capture there. As governor, as ruler in the book of, in the Old Testament, the leaders were often called fathers. Would you guys understand that? The kings were called fathers. The prophets were called fathers. The priests were called fathers. They were just the patriarchs. Listen to the language. Here's talking about Eliakim, one of God's servants, contextually. And I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your girdle, and I will commit the government into his hand. Now, this is just 22, uh, 10 chapters later, 12 chapters later from where we are, um, where Eliakim is a great model of Christ in this context, clothing him, strengthening him. I will commit the government into his hand, and he shall be a what? Father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of what? Right. And so again, the idea of the government, the idea of leadership, exercising paternal care over its citizens is the ideal relationship that should exist in any government with any people. Am I making some sense? Now look at the next verse, verse 22. 
Here it is, because this is the verse that Christ owns, Isaiah 22, 22. Isaiah 22, 22 is the verse that Christ owns for himself as he now accepts the fact that he's the son of David. This is where we're going to close down our message. And the key of the house of who will I lay upon whose shoulders? Whose shoulders is that? Christ. So Christ is an everlasting father in this sense. He will never be a ruler that will die on you. He will never be a ruler that will leave you or forsake you. Leaders come and leaders go. Rulers come and rulers go. But our ruler is from everlasting to everlasting. He will always be on his throne. His doors will always be open to us. We can get his advice. We can get his resources. We can get his power. We can get his strength. We can come to Jesus at any time for all we need down here. Isn't that comforting? Listen to it now. His government is available to all of his people, not merely in the autocratic sense of what we need, but in the paternal sense of who he is. Shouldn't we be able to trust our leaders like fathers and like mothers? That should be the way that it is ideally. And that's the way God has set up national Israel. That's why it was so deeply mono uh, ethnic in order that that intimacy would be there in the hierarchical structure of leadership. For Jesus, he is our leader, perpetuity. He will never, ever not. And you guys remember this in Revelation 3, 17, where he says he has the keys. No man can shut when he shuts and no man can open when he opens. He's the one in control of everything. And he is a beloved father to all of us in that context. And so we have looked at the government of Christ very gingerly. As wonderful, as a counselor, as a mighty God, as an everlasting father. And finally, look at the statement that's, that consummates the characteristic of his ministry here. This is the child that you and I are celebrating. He is called the what? Prince of Peace. Do you see it? He's called the Prince of Peace. And there it is again. You and I must not collapse up under the notion that as the Prince of Peace, he's talking about political peace. You and I must not fall under the notion that as the Prince of Peace, he's talking total peace. He's neither talking political peace or total peace. He's talking spiritual peace. And he's talking particular peace. Jesus is our peace. Are y'all hearing me? All right, so I'm going to bring this home because you need to get it. Paul made it very plain in Ephesians 2.14 that Jesus broke down the middle wall of partition. The law of hostility that was between us, the Jews and God, Christ tore down in his own flesh, so making what? Peace. And he has reconciled us unto himself so that we are at peace with God. Now mark this now, this is the other blessing that Christians mess up all the time. We are so sinful. Somebody go amen. amen. Right. We are so wretchedly sinful. Right. You have not had the peace that you have in Christ since the day that God saved you. You have never had a peace like you have in your soul right now since the day that God has saved you. You have gone through all kinds of troubles, so many kinds of troubles, so many mess ups, so many circumstances that are ugly, funky. I mean, we can get really raggedy with the terminology. But in your soul, from the day he redeemed you and spoke peace to your soul, you have never, ever been separated from God. You have never, ever been under the threat of damnation because the love of God has been poured into your heart by the Holy Ghost. And all he ever says to you is peace, my child. That's all he ever says to his elect. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? As bad as our life can be, as raggedy as it can be, as much complaining as we engage in, the storms are all existential. They're all out there. They're all in here, but they're not in Christ. In Christ, we have peace. In the world, you're going to have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have already overcome the world. In me is your peace. And this is going to be part of what I'm going to talk to you about here in a moment as we strategize for the year 2021. So why, why are believers forfeiting that deep, profound, immutable, unchangeable, 
destined for glory, peace. Why are believers not recoursing to that peace as a hiding place to regroup, to overcome the folly of your circumstances? So I'm, all, I'm already segueing because the way you overcome the world is to return to the center of your hope. To get back to the shelter. Climb right back inside of Jesus mentally. And make it very clear all things are actually working together for good to them that love God. You don't let the world define your status. God has decreed it. You're perfect in Christ. You're wise in Christ. You're an overcomer in Christ. Nothing will ever separate you. What peace comes with that kind of proposition? All came in a child. All came in a child. Isn't that amazing? The child brought that package to us. All right, let me just deal with my last final text. I want to create something out of this. This is Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 through 5. I want to kind of create a dynamic here. Actually, whether you know it or not, we started off in Revelation 7 with the virgin. And then we moved to Revelation chapter 9 with his government. Now we're moving to Revelation chapter 11 briefly to deal with the impact or the dynamic of his ministry. This actually becomes even more intrusive, but I just want you to capture what I would call the expression of God the Father relative to what Christ would do when he comes. And if you can take any consolation out of what I'm saying, you're in this as the byproduct of his unfailing power, ministry-wise. So I love this. The text tells us in Revelation chapter 11, 1, and there was given, I'm um, not Revelation, Isaiah 11, 1. I'm sorry, Isaiah 11, 1. Who's up there running the PowerPoint? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 11, 1. Uh, Isaiah 11, 1, because this is where we are. We're in the book of Isaiah, right? You, have y'all been in the book of Isaiah with me for the... Okay. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root. I love this. If we isolate this for a moment and do like a rush journey, we're dealing with an agricultural metaphor. And the agricultural metaphor is of a tree being planted. And what you're looking at is the growth of a tree in a very miraculous way in very contradictory circumstances. Really what you're looking at is the promise of something that could not happen apart from the grace of God. Okay, so I want to actually look at this for a moment and help you capture four things here. Basically, it's the idea of a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch out of his root. Y'all got that? Rod, stem, branch, root. When Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, a rod, a rod, a rod shall proceed or come forth out of the stem, what he's talking about metaphorically is a branch, literally a branch, shooting out of the body of a tree. The person that's watching it is seeing a miracle of a branch reaching way out, not only reaching out, but then bearing flower and bud and fruit on that branch. Okay? It's the analogy of two things. The go forth into all the world, be fruitful and multiply. This here is the kind of dynamic of multiplication, but it's also the inference of missional work being successful. Missional work being successful. Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel and make disciples. What Isaiah is doing in a very incongruent context is showing you how a root out of dry ground can become a big tree and bear forth branches and bring forth fruit almost miraculously. That root is Jesus. That root has its origins historically in the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant meaning God's promise to David. Now, David was the son of who? Jesse. And so when God uses this term in Isaiah chapter 11, 1, he's really showing you and I something about the humility of Christ's origin as a man. When you go back and start looking up Jesse, you look up and you realize that Jesse was a poor man. His family was extremely poor. And David came from one of the poorest families in Bethlehem of Judah. In fact, the way Micah chapter five, verse two puts it, he talks about Ephrathah. 
of Bethlehem of Judah. Listen to the language. Micah 5 verse 2, I, I believe will express this uh, better for us because I just want you to capture a concept that I've talked to you about. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you be what? You are little among the thousands of Judah. Stop right there because it's going to do the same thing. So this here is what I was saying earlier about you and I wanting to capture the principle of humility. Did you hear that? Humility. Because that's what God does. He's going to bring you low. He's going to bring you low before he lifts you up if you're his. And we have to embrace that because that's the message of the gospel. Here the prince of glory enters into the nation of Israel, but not only into the nation of Israel, one of the scrawniest, least reputable cities in all of Judah. Y'all got that? Now we're in the Bay Area. Somebody give me an analogy of, 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 of that. Anywhere. What, what's one of these little annex towns? Yeah, that's cold, but it's true. <laughs> they said San Lorenzo. That'll work. Only it's 10 times smaller. Right. And then him growing up in Nazareth was growing up in a trailer park culture. That's where the Prince of Glory came, was born, and lived his early days. This is why the elite in Judah and Jerusalem despised him. Remember what the ruler said in John chapter 7? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Out of Galilee. Remember that? But this is the way the gospel works. It works in the paradox and tension of things that are in our eyes despised. And the picture that you and I have before us is the idea that God promises that you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall what? Come forth. See that phraseology? That's our same verb form. Come forth. Grow. Prosper. In a miraculous way. What? Unto me. This is God's word. Him that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, even from everlasting. Who are we talking about, saints? Jesus. Who's talking about him? God the Father. What is God saying? He will come into the world under the lowliest of circumstances. Go back to Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 1, Isaiah 11, verse 1. So in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, what we're dealing with is a rod concept. And what I want you to capture around the rod simply is this. The rod speaks to the application of power. The rod speaks to the application of power. What Isaiah is saying to you and me is that Jesus becomes God's application of power. Now see, if you're an old school child, the moment we use the word rod, you go, yeah, I remember. <laughs> the application of power. Right? I'm trying to get y'all home. I'm trying to get you home. Christ becomes the application of power in that he becomes the mean by which God subdues sinners to himself. And this is where he constantly is stated as, and he shall come with a rod of iron. You saw that in Revelation 12, 5, right? Him that was born unto him shall he be given a rod of iron with which he shall what? Rule the nations. He was caught up to God in his throne. The rod of iron, you got to see, is really his decree, his proclamation, his preaching. The preaching of Christ is the rod. OK, it's his authority, it's his power by way of application. The next thing you see is that rod shall come out of the word of Jesse. The stem of Jesse, the stem, contextually and grammatically, is the word branch. But we're going to work that through, okay? So the rod is the application. The stem or the branch now is the position of authority that Christ holds. Christ is called the branch. He's called the branch over and over and over again. Are you guys hearing me? He's called the branch because he's second in command. God the Father is first in command. Remember what Jesus said in John 15? I am the vine tree. You are the what? See, there's a sub subordinate role there, but it is nevertheless very glorious because the branch speaks to the manifestation. Watch this now. The manifestation of his authority. The manifestation of of God's authority. So when we're talking about the branch, look at Jeremiah 23, 5. I'm going to pull up two verses just to underscore it. Rod, application of his authority. Kids know that. 
branch manifestation of his power, manifestation of his authority. That means as a branch, you have a position that people see that you exercise an influence over others. Here's what Jeremiah says. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise up unto David a what? I will raise up unto who? David. Joseph and Mary are of the house of David. This is the Davidic covenant we're talking about, are we not? This is about the throne of the God-man Jesus who comes through the line of David. What is he called? A righteous what? Now, remember what we've learned here at Grace? All that he is, I am where? In him. And all that I am, he was for me. If he's a branch, are we not branches? Go to work. Go to work. Because if you work through the language and you understand that the branch is a visible manifestation of authority, a visible manifestation of authority, then you will see your privilege in him. Did you hear what I just stated? If, if Jesus is divine and we are the branches and his father is the husbandman, are not the branches then to be the visible manifestation of his glory, splendor, and power? I'm going to leave it with you. I'm, I'm going to leave it with you. The church then is a branch along with Christ. Would you agree with that? Is the church a branch along with Christ? Now notice how the language goes. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign, and what? There it is. This is what we call the exegetical. Didn't I just say in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, that the going forth of the rod is the budding forth of that branch, the manifestation of his multiplication and his prosperity. You're getting the vision of a tree growing fast and powerful and actually impacting the world. And this is what you get in Isaiah 9, too. The government will be upon his shoulders. Those five appellations are qualities. And here... I will raise up unto David a branch, and a king shall what? Reign. Does Christ reign? And what? Prosper. Does he prosper? Child of God, listen. Are you a child of God? Then if he doesn't prosper with anybody, he's prospered with you. Heaven has opened up, come down, and found the soil of your heart and placed the incorruptible seed of Christ in it. And in a miracle of grace, he has borne fruit in your soul. And the tree of life is in you and is bearing fruit through you. Do you believe this? It's so true. It's so true. It's so true. He shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Thank you, Lord, for your body. I get it. I sure get it. And I understand the dignity of being a branch. Because your own display. Y'all got that? This is really crazy, because look at God. Y'all got a few more minutes? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you out there. Just, just, think about what, just think about you burn a few more calories, and you get to worship more fully, because I've taught you how to see God as you eat, right? So you get to see God more fully as you eat. Just think about being a branch in the tree. The goal of the branch is to glorify the tree. You strip the tree of the branches and there are no glory. Am I making sense? Look at how God is secure in himself to grant you and me to be the display of his glory. That's how secure he is in himself. Like, I wouldn't let you be a tree. If, if I was the tree, I wouldn't let you be a branch. I just, I couldn't trust you. I just couldn't trust No, not them. I probably would be a tree with like just one or two branches on it. Because I couldn't trust you. Here God has a tree with branches everywhere, reaching out all over the world, whole message in itself, going back to that one seed that became a great tree and filled the earth. And it can't be done without each and every member of the body of Christ. In all of the subtle nuances of our worldly circumstances in our situations, in our homes and in our families and on our jobs and in our churches and in life in general. Am I making some sense? The gospel gets to impact people everywhere, subtly, but effectually. Here's the other verse that underscores the application of it. This is Jeremiah chapter 33. 
He lays this out in Jeremiah 33, 15. This one here going to blow you away, but here's the application. Notice what he says in Jeremiah 33. He says, in those sta- days and at that time, I will cause the what? Now, who's the branch of righteousness? Now, watch this. To grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Verse 16. Beautiful Beautiful language. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Anybody see it? Christ is the righteous branch. He's the Lord our righteousness, but she shares in his glory. Does she share? The twain shall become what? Isn't that the way the book of Revelation closes? The glory of God in the bride, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. We share in that glory. You know where we mess up, saints? We mess up in disassociating ourselves with him who is our glory. This is where we mess up. We might look at Jesus over there and see all that over there and fail to understand that he has intended for that to be us in him. And the impact of who he is in us should impact us in our own eyes relative to who we are in him. Does that make sense? But I see a disconnect that happens between us. We are fine with Jesus being over there all glorious by himself. But if you do that, it's like a branch cutting itself off from the vine. Am I making some sense? I want to be consciously aware of all that I am in Christ. I want to be able to benefit from all that he is for me. I want to be able to sue the throne of God for God to do in me what he purposes to do in me so that I don't fail to bring him glory in all the areas of my life for which Christ assumed a human nature as a baby. Y'all got that? Go back then. Just a couple more things here. We looked at the rod. It speaks to application of power. We looked at the branch. It speaks to the position of authority. We look now again at the stem one more time. And this is brief, but it's not hard because he started off with the rod. He called it the, the branch, the stem, but it's a branch. Then we look in again back at he, at Isaiah chapter 11, verse one, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. See that term branch growing out of his roots, that branch growing out of his roots is really the stem and a stem shall grow out of his roots. That root is the last thing that we want to deal with. And that root really is the idea of the source of the tree root. In fact, that stem root connotation there is the idea of not only the root but the stump of the tree the stump of the tree the way we understand this word I think is best explicated in Job chapter 14 starting at verse 7 you've heard this language before but Job is going to explain it more fully for us in Job 14 verse 7 look at the question is there hope for a tree if it be cut down what's the question yes I love that somebody said no. Good. You're thinking, you're thinking naturally. But listen to how Job speaks. He says, for there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again. And the tender branches thereof will not what? The glory of that tree is in the root of the tree. So that even though the tree get cut down, If the roots and the stump are still in the ground, there's hope for that tree. Am I making some sense? Watch the next verse. Watch this verse eight. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground. Verse nine. Yet though the scent through the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth bowls like a plant. You didn't get that. But Job got it. Because Job saw himself as that tree that was cut down by his trials. So cut down that there was no glory in Job. His stock is gone. His branches are gone. His leaves are gone. His fruit is gone. He's been cut down so low. All there is is a stump. And everybody wrote him off as dead. 
But Job says you fail to understand under this ugly stump that bears the humility of being cut off just like my Savior Jesus Christ was cut off. Under that stump are roots. Under that stump are roots. And those roots, those roots reach way down. And they look for a water source. And if they can just find a little water, they go, ah, oh, I got it. Ah, oh, I got it. And over time, you begin to see life occur in a tree that everybody counted was dead. What we're talking about is resurrection power. What we are talking about is the restoration of life that was in that tree all the time by decree. Because while the tree was cut down, while the stump was cut, the roots were still there. And that's Isaiah 51, 3, like a root out of dry ground. Now, I want to make an application as we close, because you guys know this already. You already know that Christ is our life. You already know that he is the root and offspring of David, don't you? You already know he's the bright and morning star. He already made it plain that I'm David's God, while at the same time I'm David's son. Does that make sense? Can he be his son and his God at the same time? Before Abraham was, I am. All right. It's one o'clock. Y'all get to go home. Now watch this. So this is the point of uh, application for the year. So next, next week when we come back, it'll be the new year, Lord willing, right? All right. So I just want to share this with you because this here's where I'm at. And I hope you can get it. If you, if you can embrace the concept of a root and you understand that a root actually is in a process of humility by virtue of the water poured upon it and the dunging that takes place on the top. All of that water being poured upon it, it being nurtured and cultivated by a kind of storm, a pummeling on top of it, forces it to take deeper root. It forces it to reach down to establish itself. In other words, trouble is designed to make the roots go deeper. Stay with me. I'm not done. So the roots go deeper in order that the tree might grow higher, that the branches might grow wider, that the fruit may be more evident, that God might be more glorified. Amen. Now, now, this line of reasoning comes out of Isaiah 37, in the same context in which we are in, in Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, and Isaiah 11, where God has plainly told Israel, you're going to be beat down. You're going to be chopped down because of your rebellion and your sin. I'm going to allow the Assyrians to come in and mow you down. Listen to me. So bad. Even though you were like the sands of the sea for number, you will be just a little twig here. And a little twig there. And a little twig here. Apparently. He says, but don't you move. If you stand still and you wait on me, I will cause you to flourish again. This is Isaiah 37. He says, I'm going to force you, Isaiah 37, to take root downward. Are you hearing me? I'm going to force you to take root downward. So you can bring forth fruit upward and bring glory to God. I'm going to force you to take root downward. I'm going to force you to take root downward. I'm going to force you to do something that you don't like. I'm going to take you through something that's going to be extremely difficult for you. You're not going to like it, but it's going to benefit you. This was in the days of Hezekiah. And the Assyrians were coming after them, if you recall. And they were going to destroy them. But God told him, don't you worry about it. They're not going to even touch you. I wish I had time. Read it yourself, Isaiah 37. I wish I had time. It's such a beautiful text of scripture. Here's the point that I want to bring home in the light of that for you and me, though. In this year, 2021, what I want you to think about is thriving. Thriving. You can write it down. I'm going to just bug you for a minute. Thriving. Right. 
So have you, do you ask yourself sometimes, you know, how, how, how come I'm not thriving? How come I'm not prospering? How come I seem to be at such a low ebb? Do you ever ask yourself that? Do you ask yourself in an honest moment, why do I feel like I'm not bearing any fruit? I'm struggling all over the place. Just all, when I look at myself, all I look at is struggle. So what I want us to talk about, and I'm going to unpack it in the new year as a theme. I'm actually calling your attention to the text. It'll come back up. We'll deal with it. Is the ability to embrace struggle in order to define your thriving in God. How is it that God causes us to thrive? Where is it that God causes us to thrive? Where are the areas in my life that God has blessed me to function, to actually be productive, to actually be able to live and enjoy him even in the midst of difficulty? Please hear me, because I can tell you what the enemy would love for you and I to do. is to see it all bad. To see it all bad. Do you hear me? To see it all bad. To see no redemption in it at all. To see no glory in it at all. See no productivity in it at all. And I want you to think with me. How does God cause his people to thrive? To thrive. And he never does it apart from struggle. He never does it apart from struggle, child of God. It's always in the struggle that he's calling you and I to find his mercy and his grace and to allow that mercy and his grace to teach us to be counterintuitive, to be able to function in a joy that is rooted not in my circumstances, but in his promises, in his faithfulness in my life, in his goodness in my life. So for us, thriving is going to be about being able to recognize his blessings and then embrace those blessings legitimately and joyfully. Thank you, Lord, for health and strength. Thank you, Lord, for a roof over my head. Thank you, Lord, for a little bit of financial reprieve. Thank you, Lord, for a sound mind. Thank you, Lord for being able to comprehend your glory. Thank you, Lord, for faith not to believe this dumb crap that's going on in my world. Thank you, Lord, for discernment. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for humility. Thank you for grace to stand. Because there the branches are spreading out. And people can see the flower and the fruit. And it's happening because you're staying in your place and you're allowing it to occur. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, the goal of the enemy is to cut you off. So that you are just a branch on the side of the road. And that would be a lie. From everything we heard today, that would be a lie. If it was a lie for Christ, it's a lie for you. If when they cut him down, laughed and rejoiced as if that was his permanent position, but God raised him from the dead in three days, can he also resurrect your situation? Can he cause you to bear fruit upward even though you take root downward? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I'm telling you what we're going to need this in 2021. You're going to need to know how to take root downward, okay? You're gonna need it, amen.